What's up, everybody? Oh, well, that's not my intro. What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone. Uh, I don't know why I said everybody there, but it doesn't matter. Um, welcome to the Bobby Dots conclusion, story number two, The Storyteller. Um, I am super excited for this one. If you don't know, the description for this one is the one about the board of directors. So from that, we know that this is going to be pretty big, honestly, because we, we haven't really ever seen like the higher ups of Fazbear Entertainment before. So it's going to be really interesting to see what's going on there uh, and perhaps what is um, telling the story or whatever. I don't know what this story is going to be about, really, but um, it's just really exciting that we get to see the higher ups in this. So I think we just get straight into it. This is, of course, leaks from the Reddit Discord. Um, so thank you, Anton. Uh, I always make this joke, but also a lot of people hate you right now because uh, the leaks are kind of a bad thing. Um, but uh, a good thing I'm making videos about it then, right? Uh, anyway, so uh, I don't know how, like, I'm talking very fast and, and very uncalculated because I'm very excited for this story. So if you enjoy this, then make sure you subscribe uh, and you join my Discord too in the description. I, I keep forgetting to promote that, but uh, yeah, let's get into it. The storyteller, Mr. Burroughs, plucked the wire-rimmed reading glasses from his Romanesque no nose, not noise, and used the glasses to tap the spreadsheet in front of him. He gave the accountant sitting on the left side of the massive cherrywood conference table one of his best withering glares. Uh, I'm an accountant. <laughs> uh, also, I forgot to say, like, I am reading this, but it's, it's also a reaction. Um, so, uh, obviously, uh, like, you, you came here because of that. Anyway, it feels like you're boxing us in here, Mr. Burroughs said. These numbers can't be real. Mr. Burroughs looked down the length of the 16-foot table. His gaze went from the accountant to each, from the accountant to each of the other eight board members in turn. It finally landed on one other man in the room besides the accountant who wasn't a board member. Mr. Burroughs sighed. Sitting at the far end of the table, directly opposite Mr. Burroughs, Edwin Murray gazed out the picture window that took up much of the outer wall of the red painted conference room. They're in the Fazplex Tower. No way. Yeah, like. I, I thought, like, in my head, like, hmm, they set up the Fazplex Tower for the higher-ups of the company, right? So are they going to have this story in the Fazplex Tower? It sounds like it is. That's very cool. <laughs> very cool. Um, it means that it's all connected. Murray's bulging grey eyes were unfocused, as if he were looking past the me mega pizza plex that dominated the view from the Fazbear Entertainment ex Executive Office building. This is so cool. The old coot was probably looking even further than the hills, out into some kind of virtual la-la land in his strange mind. The head chairman of Fazbear Entertainment getting revealed, and there's still arguments going on. Mr. Burroughs! <gasps> Mr. Burroughs was the head of Fazbear Entertainment! Chairman and CEO are not the same, yeah, obviously, but he's very high up, yeah. That's really cool, Mr. Burroughs. So, was it Edwin Burroughs? No, it's something else Burroughs. <laughs> I don't know the name of him, but um, Mr. Burroughs. Okay, cool. So, we've, we've been introduced to the head of Fazbear Entertainment. That's pretty cool. It's pretty mind-blowing. Uh, at 35 years old, Mr. Burroughs was the youngest ever Fazbear Entertainment board chairman. It was uh, a coup to have achieved such a position so quickly, but it was one he deserved. Um, he had an IQ in the stratosphere. Uh, he looks like Christian Bale. <laughs> Mr. Burroughs knew from hours of studying himself in the mirror that when his glasses were situated just so on the prominent bridge of his slightly downward curved nose, his powerful stature as a man to be listened to was unmistakable. Mr. Burroughs understood that he wasn't handsome in the classical sense. He had a fine jawline, sculpted cheekbones, and a strong, full mouth. However, the majestic nose was just a bit too majestic, and his eyes were a tad too small and set close together. Even so, his dark, almost black eyes and the shiny, ebony hair that liked to flop over his broad forehead in a sort of charming way combined with the aforementioned nose to create eye-catching impact. People noticed Mr. Burroughs, and they listened to him, despite his relatively young age. That is... An incredible description right there. That's really well written. Mr. Burroughs scanned the cost spreadsheet that was the focus of this board meeting. If these numbers are correct, he said, the Mega Pizzaplex won't make one red cent the way it's currently set up. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking this might explain some of the the markings in, in the Pizzaplex that we saw in Security Breach. Because uh, there, were, there were some that was like uh, numbers in different quarters of the year. Uh, and like how it's increased and decreased and stuff like that. Maybe this will explain some of that. I don't know. Um, 
The Mega Pizza Plex won't make one red cent the way it's currently set up. That means we have to pare things down. If we shave off the excess, we can raise the profit margin and get out of the box. Right, yeah. Um, Mr. Burroughs put his finger on the line item that had gone into detention. Is this figure correct? He asked Dale. Dale? Dale was, Dale was in, um, Dale was in the tapes from Tape Girl in FNAF VR. Dale was in, Dale was first for entertainment, of course. So is Dale now promoted higher up? That's really cool if that's, that's the same Dale. Um, is this figure correct? He asked Dale, the skinny young accountant who was supposedly a savant with numbers. Mr. Burroughs knew Dale never got numbers wrong, but he liked to keep the kid in his place. I think it might be a different Dale, but whatever. Um, Dale cleared his throat. Um, yes, sir, I ran the Mr. Burroughs waved a hand. Afternoon sun streaming in through the window caught the diamonds in his pinky ring and refracted a rainbow across the printed spreadsheet. This is amazing writing. Mr. Burroughs took a moment to enjoy the reds and blues and yellows. He loved reds and blues and yellows. That was why the conference room was filled with those colours. All the paintings on the walls, impressionistic depictions of classic retro Fazbear animatronic characters featured the vibrant colours Mr. Burroughs favoured. They melded nicely with the room's red walls. I'm sure the number is right, Mr. Burroughs said. Even if it's not exact, the, the import is clear. Clearly, creative development is gobbling up a massive chunk of our overhead. The team is going to have to be downsized. Now we get a perspective switch to our B-plot antagonist. <gasps> That's so cool. The perspective switches? This is insane. Edwin had only been peripherally paying attention to the board meeting ever since he'd reluctantly taken his seat at the outlandishly large table. These meetings were generally a waste of time, but given that Edwin had been placed onto the board via Fazbear Entertainment's buyout of his engineering company decades before, he was expected to be here. Um, Goddamn, he hates Burroughs. Edwin loathed Burroughs. The affected, vain, pompous jerk who refused to be called by his given name was not only annoying in the extreme, but he was also dangerous. Uh, Mr. Burroughs didn't think, he just acted. Case in point, the decision he'd just made. Edwin, who had been trying to pretend he wasn't in the room, whipped his gaze away from the window. Did I hear you right? He asked, knowing full well that he had. Um, awesome characters? Good to hear. Did you just suggest downsizing the heart and soul of the Mega Pizzaplex, firing the very people who have been responsible for the Pizzaplex's enthusiastic popularity? Ooh. Mr. Burroughs sighed and closed his eyes. I take issue with your premise, he said as if talking to himself. The creative development team has contributed to this pizza plex's success, obviously, but to say they've been responsible for it is to strain the truth to its breaking point. Wow. Wow. Edwin opened his mouth, but Mr. Burroughs didn't let him speak. This is really cool, yeah. Uh, Burroughs says, spending this much money on creative content, nothing more than the ideas of people sitting around making stuff up is outrageous. The backbone of the Pizzaplex, in fact of Fazbear Entertainment as a whole, isn't the stories, it's the technology. Without the tech, without the animatronics and the software that runs them, the stories are nothing. We might as well be selling camping excursions, um, requesting that people pay for the privilege of being told a horror story while they roast marshmallows. Good point, honestly. I can tell you from years of experience that without the stories, all your hardware and software would be nothing more than lumps of metal and wires and a meaningless mass of zeros and ones. Story drives Fazbear Entertainment. This is so good. I, I like, I've just, in my mind, a lot is going on. Um, that is great. That is a great um, kind of like dilemma here. Kind of like a lesser of two evils, right? People want the stories so that the robots aren't just pieces of metal, but people want the robots just so that it's not a boring time with story. Like, you know, it needs to go hand in hand. And they're being, like, very controversial about it in the fact that they both want different things. They, they're on the opposite sides of the spectrum. Uh, and so they're not going to, like, have it their own, their, the other person's way or whatever. Um, Mr. Burroughs toyed with his showy pinky ring. Be that as it may. But, Edwin started, Mr. Burroughs held up his ring-free hand. I'm not suggesting that we give up story development, Edwin. Um, Edwin felt his jaw muscles bunch at the way Mr. Burroughs used his name. Mr. Burroughs always put heavy emphasis on the win part of Edwin. The stress was purposeful, a slap in the face reminder that Edwin wasn't a winner at all. Oh, wow, that's amazing. That's so good. The only reason he was part of Fazbear Entertainment was because his own company had failed. Mr. Burroughs loved to remind Edwin of that fact. Mr. Burroughs looked around at the other board members. Wouldn't you agree, ladies and gentlemen, that Fazbear Entertainment has the best minds in the industry? 
Edwin rolled his eyes as he watched the board members nod. Mr. Burroughs knew darn well that no one at the table was going to disagree. The Phasma Entertainment Board was made up of five men and four women. Edwin, at 64 years old, was the oldest person in the room. At least I'm not the baldest, he thought. <laughs> I love this hostility, it's great. Two of the five men were full-on bald, and two of them had receding hairlines. Everyone in the room ex exuded wealth. Edwin knew that if someone had the temerity to come into the room and rob its occupants, the jewellery hall alone would be in the hundreds of thousands. Edwin, in contrast, wore nothing but an old Timex watch. I see no reason why the creative process can't be automated, Mr. Burton said. What? Edwin said. Oh, come on now, Mr. Burton said, levelling a condescending glance at Edwin. You can't tell me that story creation can't be computerised. They AI generate songs in the future. Uh, record labels use software to generate songs. I don't see why we can't create stories in a similar way. Computers can't write stories, Edwin said. Why not, Mr. Burroughs said. Most of Phasma Entertainment stories, the ones that are the most popular, share similar elements. I think it quite likely uh, that these elements and a series of pre-programmed options could be used in concert to come up with new randomly generated stories. We'd use the same principle to create a computer program that would combine various tropes and characters to come up with an endless variety of stories. This sounds like a horrible idea. Mr. Burroughs snapped his fingers again. We could call the program the storyteller. Genius, one of the women said. I have a feeling it's going to be Glitchtrap. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm have a feeling that Glitchtrap has taken over. Um, a couple of the men chimed in with inspired and love it. <laughs> That's so random. Um, that's really cool art, yeah. Um, Edwin couldn't take it. He pounded on a fist on the table. I can't believe you're talking about firing the creative team. A computer can't. Mr. Burroughs ignored Edwin. He leaned forward, his beady little eyes all lit up like an eagle with an injured bird in its sights. We could even turn the storyteller into part of the Pizza Plex's appeal. It could be a huge draw. It would become the star of every show, the Pizza Plex's ringmaster, if you will. Mr. Burroughs laughed and threw out his arms as if he was introducing the cast of a three-ring circus. Edwin could almost hear tinny circus music in his head. Send in the clowns. Where are the clowns? <laughs> what a ludic- Oh, uh, sorry. That's a ludicrous idea, Edwin protested. Your idea is a slap in the face to all the hard-working people who've created all these storylines you're planning to stuff into some insane computer program. True. Uh, Eddie, buddy, I don't think you're aware, but they didn't create those. True as well. Um, hard-working doesn't mean good, Mr. Burroughs said. If their stories were good enough, the Pizzaplex would be generating enough revenue to cover all the expensive creative team salaries. Clearly there's room for improvement, and I think we should hand the task of that improvement over to the tech team. They can create the storyteller. Edwin stood up so fast that, it, that his chair spun out behind him and hit the wall. Your plan is to insult me, and to every writer on the creative team. Fair enough, honestly. Edwin's offensive side... Oh, sorry, of Edwin's offence side, who's in favour of creating the storyteller and letting it take the place of the creative, the current creative teams, Burroughs said. Sorry, I messed up that a lot. Edwin glared at the other board members as every man and woman in the room raised a hand. Unbelievable. You're all idiots. Uh, Mr. Burroughs pressed his lips together and stared down his nose at Edwin. Careful, Edwin. You're getting close to getting yourself thrown out of this meeting, if not the company. Um, don't get too big for your... Britches. <laughs> I almost said bitches, Mr. Burroughs. I can't be fired. As you know, you, as you should know if you've bothered to read my buyout contract, and I may not have a lot of power here, but I can't. You can do nothing, Mr. Burroughs said, flicking his fingers toward Edwin as if he was a pesky mosquito. But I tell you what, because I'm feeling magnanimous, <laughs> magnanimous, I'll, we'll make you a consultant on the project. Oh no. You can have some input on what story elements are programmed into the storyteller. Edwin's chest constricted. His doctor had told him he shouldn't let himself get riled up. It was bad for his heart. If you fi finish with the theatrics, Mr. Burroughs said, perhaps you could retake your seat. Peg, could you please help Edwin? Peg got up from her seat to Edwin's right. She gave him a gentle pat on the shoulder as she stepped past him and retrieved his chair from where it had come to rest, next to a table that held a silver coffee urn and a crystal plate full of fancy pastries that were always present at the meetings and that no one ever ate. Peg pulled Edwin's uh, chair over to the table. She took his arm and escorted him to his seat like he, uh, he was geriatric. Edwin had his issues, he knew. 
He'd been haunted for years by the things that he should have done differently. Edwin could think of a dozen ways the storyteller could go wrong. If he had any hope of preventing a tragedy, he had to keep it together. No one would listen to him if he was ranting. Waylon, a balding man with very large teeth, asked, What should the storyteller look like? Peg chimed in. That's a good question. If the storyteller will itself be a character seen by the Pizzaplex's patrons, it will still have to be something other than a garden variety computer interface. We'll think of something, he chuckled. Maybe we should get the storyteller itself, sorry, maybe we should let the storyteller itself decide what it's going to look like. A rumble of laughter swept the room like an ocean wave rushing in and receding. Last two pages, okay. Uh, well, no, not of the full story, but like, of, yeah. And blah, 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 blah. Uh, Once again, blocking out the discussion around him, Edwin looked past the self-important board members. He's, his gaze scanned the ridiculously modernist art on the room's vast walls. I love that contrast there. Uh, he could remember when the boardroom had been decorated with a framed Freddy Fazbear Pizzeria signboards. Edwin had enjoyed the vintage posters. Mr. Burrows, however, had ordered the old posters removed as soon as he had become the board chairman. He was going to have them put in the trash, but Edwin had rescued them and taken them home. Ooh. Yeah, something definitely happened to Edwin in his past. Something that Because he, he seems very persistent on... Oh, actually, it might be the opposite. It might be the opposite. I think um, freaking Mr. Burrows uh, is very persistent on replacing everything. You know, like getting rid of these old stories, making sure the history of Fazbear Entertainment is never remembered, really. That's that's an interesting thing to do, I think. I don't know. I, I might be completely wrong about that, but yeah. He wasn't sure why he wanted them. He hadn't hung them on the walls of his pathetic one-bedroom walk-up. In all honesty, Fazbear posters reminded Edwin of a past he'd rather have forgotten. Oh, okay, there we go. That's what End Tom is talking about. If he'd been forced to, t uh, to explain himself, uh, he'd probably have to admit that keeping the signboards was a form of self-punishment he had to atone for and no way to do it. Maybe keeping the images of Freddy Fazbear close was Edwin's way of keeping himself on the hook for all the mistakes he'd made, mistakes that had snowballed into a disaster that the day he'd agreed to sell his company to the behemoth that was Fazbear Entertainment. The truth was that even though Edwin tried to make himself useful at the company and tried to live a semi-normal life, he was rarely a actually in the present moment. He lived primarily in the past, back in the days before he'd made a hash of everything. Edwin's cardiologist had reminded that Edwin see a therapist, and the therapist told Edwin that he had to learn to be more mindful. You must stop relieving what is no longer real. Oh, sorry, stop reliving. Um, pa practice mindfulness. Concentrate on the details of the reality around you. Be present. That was easier said than done, so he didn't even bother to try. Yes, he moved through the real world, but he didn't see much of his old life. Replays of his worst mistakes, images of what he'd once had and lost. Mr. Burrows clapped his hands and snapped Edwin out of his reverie. Edwin blinked and looked over at the board's bombastic leader. To be continued this Friday. Thankfully, I'm recording this on Saturday, so... Um, da 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 What is this? I'm gonna save that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do 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 what the oh that's really cool actually anyway uh it's decided then mr burrow said we'll get the design team working on the storyteller asap even though his heart rate was under control and his expression was placid deafening warning bells were going off in edwin's head he was experiencing a sense of deja vu and that wasn't a good thing not a good thing at all uh, transition cut, apparently the story is taking over a time lapse of the construction, which is really cool, giving glimpses of progress in between. Oh my gosh. Edwin was given a consulting role on the project. Wait, 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 wait. So this is before the Pizzaplex is like a, a full thing? Or is the Pizzaplex actually already like fully built and done? I don't know. I, th I, I think this is before. I'm pretty sure this is during construction. Um... Edwin was in consulting role on the project, but he was never actually allowed to consult. He was aggressively kept on the periphery of the engineering process, so much so that he was never even allowed to see the storyteller specs. That made him nervous, very nervous. On the rare occasions that Edwin did offer an opinion on the storyteller, that opinion was ignored. He had suggested that they built a storyteller in the remote part of the Pizzaplex. Instead, they built it right in the centre of the atrium. Oh my gosh. 
Construction of a central hub began days after the board approved the creation of the Storyteller. Like everything else, the design of the hub was Mr. Burrow's idea. I think the Storyteller should reside in a huge fake tree. <laughs> oh. uh, since Story is the lifeblood of Fazbear Entertainment, it makes sense that the Storyteller would be the lifeblood of the Pizzaplex. Right. Um, the board team discusses and argues about what type of tree it should be. Um... The other team members begin talking at once. Edwin heard redwood, eucalyptus, olive, fig, and poplar. Um, <laughs> popular, poplar. I don't, I don't know that tree. Okay, I know all the others. I just don't know that tree. Everyone had some reason for their tree choice. No one liked anyone else's idea. The discussion was beginning to degenerate into a shouting match when Edwin cleared his throat and said loudly, "Baobab." <laughs> Baobab. The rest of the team stopped talking and stared at Edwin. There's a baobab in South Africa that's over 6,000 years old. Its trunk is hollow and is a tourist attraction. There are all sorts of legends associated with the baobab tree. Given that the tree we use is housing a storyteller, choosing a tree associated with grand narratives seems appropriate. I've never heard of a bow a bow what? The freckled tech said. Baobab, Edwin pronounced slowly and patiently. They decide to agree with the Biddy Bab tree. <laughs> Not Biddy Bab. Uh, I wish. The branches would be designed to expand over the centre of the pizza plex, having the atrium dome shine down on it. That's pretty cool, actually. Edwin, what are you? Still not at all pleased with the project, Edwin felt an unexpected sense of satisfaction for having contributed to it in such a visible way. Now he just hoped that the whole thing wasn't going to be the disaster he was afraid it would be. Time lapse of the construction... Um, wait, I've completely lost where I am. Time lapse of construction, a transition to him walking, watching the tree sh slowly construct at the centre of the pizza plex atrium. Fast Freddy is still here by the time of this story as its tracks go in between some of the branches. Okay, okay. So, big thing that I didn't really fully point out in GGY is the fact that GGY is not only the security breach pizza plex, but it also mentions the climbing tubes and a high-tech roller coaster. Uh, and so that means that the Tales from the Pizza Plex Pizza Plex is 100% the Security Breach Pizza Plex, which is really exciting because we've got other stories coming in the future, um, such as Tiger Rock. I think there's also one in Nexi as well that's going to be with a VR attraction. Um, and so that's all going to tie together. That's all part of the game timeline, which is really cool. Um, we're seeing the history of the Pizzaplex. Fastware Entertainment was known for the wild and wonderful and over the top, but the Pizzaplex soared above and beyond anything the company had come up with before. From the bright yellow roller coaster track that twisted through luminous multicolored serpent like climbing tubes to the pinging, bleeping games arcade and the buzzing laser tag arena, the Pizzaplex was a masterpiece of happy sights and sounds. Scanning the boisterous cloud, crowd, he idly wondered how it might be possible to channel human joy into a machine. It had to be possible, he mused. Oh no. Oh no, this is in the flesh part two. <laughs> um, this is in the flesh, but like, off of, out of flesh. It's out of flesh. Uh, the Peterplex was packed with spun up kids and jovial families and the happy screams and shouts and chatter was like an electrical circuit that, if it could have been harnessed, possibly would have generated enough power to run a dozen Peterplexes. Edwin watched a little girl wearing a bright pink frothy dress slip past. The girl's patient leather Mary Jane shoes tapped a sprightly rhythm on the tile floor. Edwin smiled, but then a familiar old pain forced him to look away from the child. Ooh. Mr. Burroughs had decreed that the trunk of the storyteller's tree was to be the same vibrant yellow as the Pizza Plex's roller coaster. Edwin's protest that tree trunks weren't yellow was completely ignored. Um... He suggested, Mr. Burrow suggested that the branch be rainbow coloured. That's amazing. Um, so the tree that Edwin watched grow in the middle of the Peterplex was like no tree that actually existed on Earth, sprouting from a pear-shaped yellow trunk. A kaleidoscopic array of sparkling multicoloured branches exploded like a contained spray of fireworks frozen in time above the Peterplex's core. Amazing writing. Uh, in actuality... Huh. Uh, in actuality, the roots were a network of wiring that connected to every venue of, in the Peterplex. That wiring would sync up with the story, driven attractions, 
and feed its programming to the appropriate hardware. Every animatronic in the pizza plex would get its instructions from the storyteller via the tree's roots. Oh. So the storyteller is going to be Glitchstrap. The tree's roots are connected to everything. Like, like fiber optics, it's going to be connected to everything in the pizza plex. Glitchtrap is going to spread through the pizza plex. That's how Glitchtrap gets into the arcade machines. That's how Glitchtrap gets into the animatronics. That's probably how Gregory gets possessed by Glitchtrap in the first place. Um, I, I think that's that's a pretty solid theory right there, right? This is this is how they're introducing Glitchtrap to the pizza plex. I'm, I'm sure of it, I'm sure. Um, no one is allowed inside the tree, Edwin, Mr. Burroughs had said. The storyteller is inside the trunk and Mr. Burroughs believes that it's being kept in there. will add mystique to what it is. The thing controlling the network of roots is apparently the storyteller. Well, clearly someone is allowed inside the tree, Edwin protested. The tree's interior isn't being created by magic elves. How droll, Edwin. Uh, yeah, yes, of course, the construction crew is allowed inside, but no one else. I haven't even been inside the trunk. It's all hush-hush. But you're the chairman. Uh, the chairman, <laughs> Edwin said. Why would I want to spoil the surprise? Mr. Burroughs asked. Did you unwrap your gifts before Christmas, Edwin? If you do, shame, shame. Mr. Burroughs clicked his tongue and turned away from Edwin. Bro thinks he's the Zoolander. Um, then... I keep losing where I am. Uh, when Edwin wasn't lurking near the construction zone, he was surreptitiously gathering every working memo related to the Storyteller project that he could get his hands on. Um, thankfully, internal security in the executive's offices wasn't stellar. The Storyteller project had been compartmentalized away from all the other Fazbear Entertainment projects. Everything related to the Storyteller was cryptic in the extreme. He did manage to, clean, uh, to glean one tidbit, though. He'd learned that the larger parts of the Storyteller were to be transferred into the tree trunk late one night after the pizza plex is closing. Let me guess. He's going to sneak in and see what it is. Given that Edwin had access to every part of the pizza plex, he was sure he could position himself at the appropriate time and place to get a glimpse of what was being placed at the hub of the pizza plex, and he was right. At 11.42pm on a drizzly Thursday evening, Edwin slipped into the pizza plex via the loading dock. He had no trouble weaving his way through the back halls until he could come out uh, into the corridor outside one of the restrooms near the jungle-like expanse of Maltese Gator Golf. He goes into the airlock lobby for Gator Golf that no longer exists. Okay, yeah. One of the fake plants in the lobby of the, pe uh, the mini golf venue provided cover for a perfect vantage point from which to observe the entrance of the storyteller's tree. From the shouts and thuds coming down the hall on the opposite side of the atrium, Edwin could tell he'd arrived just in time. Something was being brought in. Edwin brushed aside a wide, thick plastic leaf and gazed hard at the entrance of the tree. The tree's door, which wasn't so much a door as it was a hidden curved panel that blended right into the rest of the yellow trunk, was open. Unfortunately, a shadow consumed the resulting gap. Edwin could see nothing inside the trunk. He could, however, see what was being carried toward the open door. Oh no, what's it going to be? Oh no, if I had to guess, if I had to guess. Um... Oh, I, actually, I actually have zero clue. It's got to be something infected by glitch trap. I I don't have a clue. I have zero idea. Um, and what he saw stunned him. He literally could not breathe. Gr uh, gasping audibly, Edwin clutched his chest. A sharp pain shot through his rib cage, and his lungs constricted. Edwin shrank back into the shadows of the forced jungle. He dropped into a crouch, closed his eyes, and covered his ears with his hands. Uh, he wasn't trying to hide. The reason he was trying to shut down his senses was because they were transporting him back into a horror from his past. Oh, he's having a flashback. Okay. The sounds. A screech and a scream. His own yelling. The sights, blood, and so much blood. And a gut-clenching grimace. The smells. Um, it's not saying what he saw, but it's describing him as having a shell-shocked panic attack. Edwin commanded himself to get it together, and ever so easily... Uh, and ever so slowly eased toward his original vantage point. He concentrated on breathing softly and evenly as he prepared himself to take a second look at what had nearly unhinged him. And there it was, the thing of Edwin's nightmares. Um, Edwin gritted his teeth and uh, held his breath uh, again. He ignored the tremors that vibrated through his body. The three men had returned to their task, which was to carry into the hollow tree trunk 
a giant white tiger head. Tiger rock? Um... <laughs> um... So this is a Tiger Rock prequel, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, Tiger Rock prequel. Edwin could well imagine that the head was tough to hang on to. Even from this distance, Edwin could tell that the three foot wide tiger head was made of metal. The white painted head rose, um, rose up nearly four feet from a set of tiger shoulders and the underside of those shoulders was slickly smooth and gleaming silver. Wait, 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 wait. So, let's rewind. Um... Freaking, wait, what's the name of the protagonist in Tiger Rock? I actually kind of want to look that up because that's very interesting to me. Tiger Rock FNAF. Um, because if it's Edwin, then that's interesting as hell, right? Right? That's <laughs> interesting. Uh, it's Kai. Oh, it's Kai. Okay. It's not Edwin. Edwin probably dies in this. Uh, but this is probably a Tiger Rock prequel, I would say. Yeah, 100%. Um, this, but, uh, but that's the thing, like, what what's his past trauma? Like, why is a tiger, why is Tiger Rock, or whatever his name is, Mr. Tiger, why is Mr. Tiger causing him these horrors? What happened before? Oh, I want to know now. The specific tiger head is what haunted Edwin's past, apparently. He had a full-blown, nearly un- Ethered, un untethered, sorry, from reality meltdown. No disembodied tiger head would have caused that unless it was like this tiger head. Grunting and grousing, uh, the three men managed to wrangle the tiger head through the tree's open doorway. They disappeared into the shadows that obscured the tree trunk's interior, and once they did, Edwin exhaled loudly. He immediately turned and headed back the way he'd come. There was nothing else for him to observe tonight. He'd seen enough. Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, there was that annoying Kamudgian skulking behind one of the large-leafed plastic plants at the front edge of the Monty's Gator Golf. He was a persistent little rat, wasn't he? Edwin Murray had already been... Oh, oh, Mr. I wasn't reading this because, yeah, I thought you were going to do it all in the quotes. But, um, that's, that's Mr. Burroughs, uh, finding him or whatever, or seeing him or whatever. Uh, Edwin Murray had been a thorn in Mr. Burroughs' side with a buyout contract that gave him an exorbitantly, exorbitantly large salary that he in no way earned. But ever since the Storyteller Project had begun, he'd become a human gnat, constantly buzzing about, questioning every aspect of the new project. Shaking his head, Mr. Burroughs tapped a key to stop the security video replay. He made a mental note... Um, to praise the security team for bringing Murray's actions to his attention. He didn't think, however, that Murray was a problem yet. Oh, I didn't, yeah. He didn't think, however, that Murray was a problem yet. The man could do any harm watching from a distance, and there was no way he could get inside the tree that housed the storyteller. Mr. Burroughs had made sure that the tree's door was accessible only by himself and a select few of the construction team members. No, Murray wasn't an immediate issue but he might become one at some point. Mr. Burroughs would have to stay on top of the situation. Um, transition skipped back to Edwin the next day. He's still concerned, shitless, stomping through the executive offices in the Fazplex Tower. Once again, cursing the building's annoying plush carpet, Edwin charged past portraits of executives and famous characters. In a comic display of contrast, the state and proper portraits of the executives were alternated with cartoonish depictions of the characters. Edwin had always wondered whether the hallway decor was meant to poke fun at the executives or an attempt to uh, elevate the importance of the creations. Edwin never made it to Mr. Burroughs' office. Instead, he ploughed into Mr. Burroughs outside the executive washroom. Um, men of Mr. Burroughs' stature didn't use mere restrooms. Well there, Edwin. Where are you off to in such a hurry? Edwin was pounding. I need to talk to you. Oh, what a joy for me, Ms. B uh, Burroughs said sarcastically. Mr. Burroughs flipped an invisible speck off the lapel of his charcoal grey suit. He straightened the deep purple pocket handkerchief that matched his tie. Ooh, purple. Uh, it's getting deeper than I expected. What program are you using to create the storyteller's stories? Edwin asked him. Why can't you just trust the storyteller? Just tell me what program you're using. It's a simple template 
uh, style software that takes pieces of previously created stories and rearranges them into new scenarios for VR, AR, AR and arcade games. Beta testing is going beautifully, it's going to be sweet. Edwin seriously doubted that. Who's doing the programming? He asked. Mr. Burroughs waved away the question. We have our best minds on it. No need to concern yourself with it, Edwin. Now if you excuse me, I need to get to an appointment. Mr. Burroughs strode off. There absolutely was a need for concern. Edwin needed to get a look at the storyteller's programming. No matter how hard he tried, Edwin couldn't get his hands on any of the storyteller's programming specs. And then, to his profound chagrin and deep dread, the storyteller was brought online. The storyteller had a birth party. Edwin thought the storyteller's birth party was a crock. Every patron in the pizzaplex had seen the tree go up, and the storyteller itself was kept hidden. As a result, Edwin thought the hoopla surrounding the storyteller's activation was little more than high-tech tree lighting. With great fanfare, the LED lights of the tree's branches and root system were lit, and the crowd dutifully oohed and aahed at the colourful display. Edwin supposed the whole thing uh, should have been a relief. The storyteller program is running, and nothing bad was happening. Maybe all his worries had been just in his memories getting the best of him. It was up to him to monitor the impact of the program. To that end, he began hanging around the various Pizzaplex venues, observing the way its characters behaved, and analysing the new stories being portrayed on the various stages throughout the entertainment centre. He saw issues right away. The first pro problem he saw was in Roxanne Wolf. Roxanne was self-centred and competitive. She loved to admire herself in the mirror, and frequently asked others how she looked. Edwin had never really liked her personality, but it's... Uh, it was what Fazbear executives had wanted for the character and it was what Edwin expected of Roxanne when he observed her interaction with the kids in the raceway. However, sure, Roxy had always enjoyed poking at people's insecurities because of her own deep-seated self-esteem issues, but when the storyteller came online, Roxanne turned into a full-blown bully. Let's go. Let's go. It's Glitchtrap. It's Glitchtrap. <laughs> Yes! Okay. Uh, it was like her inherent lack of empathy was morphing into a more aggressive form of pathological cruelty. Ooh, that's great. Glamrock Chica used to be yellow. Then there was Chica, the bib-wearing bright yellow chicken. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's probably like a mistake on their part. Or they just, they changed. May oh! They probably changed Chica's design. Right? They probably wrote the story and then uh, and then they tried to make the model or something and uh, I'd imagine like they changed the model uh, from it being yellow to white because it looked better. Interesting. Um, then there was Chica. The bright yellow chicken was well known for her gluttonous nature. Chica's storylines nearly always included food. The chick loved pizza and was very pushy about getting it, but she was, on the whole, one of the more loving characters in the Fazbear Entertainment family. After the storyteller came along, though, that changed. Um, Chica began showing aggressive tendencies. Her loving persona was replaced with a snarky one, no longer interested in food. Chica became obsessed with getting attention. She was constantly demanding that Mr. Cupcake show her more deference. <laughs> deference, sorry. Um, Mr. Cupcake, for his part, began acting up as well. He developed the personality of a vicious terrier. <laughs> oh, great. Montgomery Gate uh, also exhib exhibited disturbing changes. The alligator featured in Monty's Gator Golf was the quintessential rock star. With a red mohawk, star-shaped sunglasses and purple shoulder pull drums, uh, Monty was a performing gator. He was all about being a rock and roller. Prone to smashing things as part of his extravagant image, Monty was always dramatic, but he had been harmless, at least until the storyteller started messing with him. Now the alligator was turning into a sulky shadow of his former self. Monty's rampages became more violent. In between, in between tantrums, he would, uh, in between in between tantrums, he withdrew into a depressive silence that was actually driving children to tears. Whatever trait was normal for them began to skew toward the dark side. The shift wasn't dramatic, none of the animatronics had turned homicidal or anything, but the altered dynamic was noticeable, at least to Edwin. I like that a lot. Uh, when Edwin brought the personality changes to Mr. Burroughs' attention, Mr. Burroughs was dismissive. They're just being a, lot, a little larger than life is all. The storyteller is amping up the conflict. Every story needs a good conflict. The program is working exactly as it should be. 
spreading outside the animatronics. Oh, not long after he had confronted Mr. Burroughs about the changes in character narratives, the Pizzaplex was beset with strange malfunctions. The glitches were relatively benign, sparking crossed wires, sh uh, shorted out electrical systems, pipe leaks, random animatronic shutdowns, sound system static, audio mix up in which characters inexplicably changed voices with one another, locked doors that should have been unlocked, unlocked doors that should have been locked. It's a glitch trap story. Yeah, w this is amazing. This is so good. Edwin had been part of Fazbear Entertainment for a long time. Therefore, the storyteller's tree aside, Edwin had access to pretty much every part of the executive building and all the company's properties. So then my question, of course, is um, how... Hmm. My question is, how did they import Glitchtrap into the tiger or the tree? Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 um, <laughs> uh, okay, I have a theory, um, this tiger, the white tiger, Edwin has seen in his past, okay, it's possible that Tiger Rock, the story that's coming later on in the series, um, which is about a VR tiger, it's possible that is a prequel, like, this is a sequel, but we don't know what happened before, which makes it more mysterious. But then we're going to find out what happened before, and it turns out that it was Glitchtrap who was in the VR, because, you know, Glitchtrap VR, kind of a common theme. Uh, and then the VR uh, Tiger Rock character was possessed by Glitchtrap. Tiger Rock was brought then, uh, out of the VR game somehow, but he was <laughs> he was brought into the tree, the tree connected to all, all, all like that, every technology piece in the Pizzaplex and that brings Glitchtrap to the Pizzaplex brings him to Afton as well I mean not Afton like Burntrap um hmm it depends when this story takes place though because I need to know when this story takes place anyway um that access included the company's archives after a project was completed all the project plans were stored in a massive warehouse on the outskirts of town are they going to talk about Freddy and Friends Ooh, Edwin always thought it iconic that a tech-savvy company like Fazbear Entertainment kept his records on hard copies, stuffed into cardboard boxes and stacked sky-high on metal shelves that seemed to go on for miles. But that was the way it was. And that was something Edwin could take advantage of. Edwin got his, uh, got in his old compact sedan and put, put it out, of, out to the Fazbear Archives building. The lobby of the Fazbear Archives is so bland and depressing. Compared to other Fazbear Entertainment buildings, the receptionist has a foxy toy on her desk. Um, when Edwin let her, the glass entrance door whoosh shut behind him, the woman looked up from a paperback romance novel. Eddie! The woman boomed in a Caribbean accent. My favourite little guy. Um, <laughs> Edwin has a riz. Hello, Chevelle, Edwin said. You're looking lovely as ever. Oh, shut your mouth, Eddie. You're needing glasses. Chevelle flipped her orange beaded uh, dreadlocks and they clicked in time to her rhythmic laugh. Thankfully, my vision is 2020, Edwin said. All the better to see your stunning beauty. Chevelle had been the head records clerk of the archives for as long as Edwin could remember. Fazbear Entertainment had a precise procedure for accessing old records. Edwin could avail himself of the records anytime he wanted, but he was supposed to apply for the records and Chevelle was supposed to bring them to him. Edwin, however, didn't want to leave a, a paper trail revealing what he was up to. I was hoping you'd let me poke around, Edwin said. I don't see why not. It's not like I can even see you. Uh, Chevelle looked up into the side like an innocent debut uh, the debutant. Nah, -uh, I can't see nothing at all. I'm just going to mosey on over here. The aisles were oppressive. Edwin always felt like he was descending into catacombs when he was in the archives. A person could easily get lost forever in the maze of records. If he finds Freddy and Friends on tour, I am going to flip. By the way. Because that has the glitch trap glitch face in it. That's if please, please. Um, no description of other records as he's looking for the storyteller. Right, he finds it under the label Baobab. For the next half hour, Edwin R Riff Lev. Oh, riffled. Sorry, not Riff Led. Riffled quickly through all the engineering specs for the fanciful Baobab tree. There has to be a way in. He muttered as he flipped through the schematics and notes, and there was. Well, wasn't that clever. He found a sketch of what he'd been looking for. 
Um, once he found what he needed, Edwin skimmed through everything relating to it. By the time he was done, he knew exactly how he could get into the Baobab tree to check on the storyteller. He's climbing fast, Freddy! <gasps> oh, it was 11.22pm uh, when Edwin made his way up the maintenance stairs to the top level of the roller coaster. Edwin's steps clanked on each tread. He wasn't concerned. He wasn't worried about being seen on CCTV either. This part of the building wasn't monitored. At the top of the roller coaster's maintenance stairs, a small corridor led to what appeared to be, at first glance, a dead end. Thanks to what he found in the archives, though, Edwin knew that the seemingly solid wall wasn't solid at all. Edwin confidently approached the wall and placed his hands on its upper right. As soon as he did, the wall parted. Once the wall parted, Edwin spotted the control panel he would need. It was right inside the opening. He reached around the opening and pressed the button he found there. A soft hum preceded a click and a telescoping catwalk uh, extended out from the wall, heading toward the branches of the baobab tree. The catwalk juddered to a stop. It clicked again. The hum ceased. Edwin gazed along the length of the stainless grated walkway. Looking down to be sure no security personnel were strolling along the concourse, Edwin grasped the catwalk's metal railings and stepped out onto the walkway. Edwin might have had his demons, but he wasn't afraid of heights. He didn't hesitate. He hurried toward the baobab's trunk. Um, oh yeah, he's 64. I forgot about that. This is crazy. As he'd read in the baobab tree's specs, Edwin found the end of the catwalk had self-anchored to the top of the tree. Just beyond the end of the catwalk, a sliding panel covered the top of the tree trunk. From what Edwin had read, the panel wasn't locked. Uh, he had, he, no one had worried about a security breach from the top of the tree. <laughs> Funny. Uh, the panel, which had a hermetic seal, slid apart swiftly. Edwin peered through the opening and spotted the first of a series of metal rungs that acted as a ladder leading down into the tree. This was it. Edwin was about to gain access to the storyteller. And that thought brought it... And that thought brought with it Edwin's first frisson of fear. What if he was right? Ooh. Ominous. From that point, Edwin was home free. He climbed down the 75-foot tree trunk just as quickly as he traversed the catwalk. He felt like a cat burglar. That thought made him smile. Edwin's smile, however, vanished instantly when he reached the bottom of the trunk. That was when he saw the storyteller in its full glory for the first time. Gleaming white, the metal tiger head was majestic, or it would have been if Edwin hadn't known what it stood for. With eyes painted in two different colours, a deep emerald green and a brilliant blue, the artwork is correct, the tiger's expression was blank. Um, the tiger, unlike real white tigers, hadn't been given stripes, and its nose and mouth were the same colour as the rest of its painted metal. The tiger's mouth was open, exposing not white but black-lit silver teeth. Uh, which you also see here. Well, kind of. Eh, yeah, not really. Uh, beyond the sharp canines, intermittently uh, blinking lights could be seen. Edwin understood he was looking at part of the storyteller's hardware. The tiger bus, which was mounted on one curved yellow painted wall of the trunk's interior, also had four spread arms which jutted from the tiger's neck, two slanted upward and two slanted downward. The mix of the le uh, LED lights crisscrossing and shining on the tiger head describes as it looking radiant and almost celestial. That's really cool. That's a really cool description of it. Celestial. Also, this gif is gonna... Oh my gosh. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that. That's a, that's. I'm saving that GIF as well. Uh, I keep saying GIF slash GIF. I, I don't know what to say because half of you are American. Um, the blank metal tiger head had triggered the old emotions, but this version of the tiger head was even more reminiscent of the one that haunted him. Edwin mentally smeared back, uh, black paint all over the pictures that were flipping through his mind. He forced himself to blot out his memories. Edwin opened his eyes. Think like an engineer, he told himself. Edwin turned away from the tiger head and spotted a small inset in the wall. He found a compact computer terminal. Its keyboard slid in and out of the inset. Edwin pulled it out. There it is. Of course, the storyteller's operating system was password protected. Uh, but Edwin didn't need to get into the system to learn what he'd come here to learn. What he had hoped he wouldn't find was right there on the start screen. The name of this program. The storyteller was running a program called Mimic... Huh? Oh my god, you might have just seen my feet. Whatever. Um, what? Mimic 1? Uh... 
<laughs> this Tales from the Pizza Plex just keeps getting better, man. I don't know how else to say it. It's it's just a wonderful book series. It's doing things amazingly. Like the fact that they introduced the mimic at the end of Epilogue 4, which I still haven't read, by the way. I'm going to do that today, I think. But uh, they did Epilogue 4, introduced the mimic, or the name the mimic, and then in the next few stories, they introduced the mimic again. That's oh, perfect. It gets better? How does it get better? Edwin knows what the mimic is. Huh? No, Edwin whispered. His worst fears were confirmed. Oh, because he's 64. He's really old. I, I, I literally just pieced this together. He's 64. He's really old. He works for Fastburn Entertainment. He is a higher up. That means he's been with the company for a long time, right? He knows about Springlock suits and stuff. He has to know. Well, everybody knows. It's part of Fazbear lore, right? We heard about that in pressure. So he knows about Springlock suits. He knows about Mimic suits now. or well, not suits, but Mimic animatronics. He knows everything he needs to know about all of this. Of course he knows about Mimic. That's insane. That's so cool. Um, this is amazing. This story it might be my favorite. <laughs> like, I really like Animatronic Apocalypse, but this story might just top it if, it if it goes somewhere good. He'd known it. He tried to pretend he hadn't known it, but he'd known it. He'd known it from the very beginning. It's the name of the glitch trap virus. Oh. Mimic. Interesting. No wonder the program is causing the Pizzaplex characters were changing. Uh, no wonder... The problem was causing the pizza plex. Oh, that doesn't make any sense, but yeah. No wonder problems were cropping up all over. It was happening again. It is happening again. Uh, and when Edwin had no idea what to do about it, Edwin opened his eyes. He winced and closed them again. He groaned. Oh. For the last five nights, Edwin had been sneaking into the storyteller's tree. His old legs weren't used to all that exercise and they were protesting. Edwin hadn't had a good night's sleep in decades. He at least managed... Um, he at least usually managed four or five sporadic hours. Now, because of his nocturnal forays into a baobab tree, he was grabbing only an hour or two before dawn, uh, forcing him awake and pushing him into this day. Uh, Edwin had added nothing of his own when he'd moved in, but uh, nothing but his clothes and toiletries, a handful of books and a small item that sat dingy and beleaguered on top of that dresser. Edwin knew he shouldn't have kept it, but he shouldn't bring himself to throw it away. It was the only thing that had left of a time that he shouldn't be allowed to forget. Edwin had spent the better part of three decades trying to forget. Wow, three decades. That's what I mean. Like, 30 years. Ooh, that's, that might be a good timeline placement. That might be good for timeline placement. He'd run as far away as he could, all the way around the world, until one day he'd run out of money, and then he'd be forced to come back and demand that Fazbear Enterprises honour their buyout agreement. Fazbear Enterprises. It's saying that Fazbear Ent Entertainment coexists with Fazbear Enterprises. It's not one or the other. They're kind of like companies above one another, uh, or kind of Fazbear Entertainment Enterprises, Fazbear Oil, I don't know. Uh... If anyone had told Edwin 40 years before that this was where he would end up, he would have laughed himself silly. Edwin Murray in a place like this? No way. Uh, 40 years because he's reminiscing 10 years prior to the loss of his company, I guess. Okay. Edwin Murray was a brilliant engineer, a creative genius. He was destined for great things. He had a, ni <laughs> he had a wife named Fiona. Okay. This hadn't just been Edwin's 24-year-old... Uh, uh, ego talking. Your company is going to change the world, Fiona had told him every morning when she when he got up and went to the old warehouse where he tinkered with his inventions and built his machines. Henry moment? <laughs> Life had been so full of promise then. Yes, money was tight at first, but Edwin started breaking through the financial wall and he and Fiona were able to move into a large fixer-upper house. The house was an old Queen Anne mansion and they'd planned to restore it to its to all its former grandeur. By then, Fiona was pregnant and she was bursting with ideas for their child's nursery and, pla and playroom. But then, the bubble burst. The promise, it turned out, had been a lie. Fiona had died in childbirth. Oh, Edwin had been left alone with a baby boy who had never stopped crying. Oh, but how Edwin loved that little boy. Oh, even lost in his own grief, Edwin had poured himself into learning to be a good dad, if only. Um, there's zero elaboration on this. Then it continues. Wow, really? Okay. 
Edwin rubbed his eyes roughly, wiping away his memories and forcing himself to face the present. I wonder if it's like a Bite of 83 situation. <laughs> that would be wild, right? And 40 years after the Bite of 83, it's 2023. But I'm just putting it out there. Uh, it's not the Bite of 83. It could be the Bite of 87. No, it can't. It can't. It's not, it's not the Bite of 87. Um, Edwin rubbed his eyes roughly, wiping away his memories and forcing himself to face the present. He stood and shuffled into the tiny space that served as his bathroom. Avoiding the mirror, he pulled off the sweat-stained white t-shirt he'd worn to bed. Stripping the rest of the way, Edwin turned on a water-spotted sp uh, faucet and ducked into the pathetic drizzle that spurted from the old lime-clogged shower head. Perspective switch to Mr. Burroughs. Mr. Burroughs adjusted the collar of his indigo blue polo shirt as he stepped onto the main concourse of the pizza plex. Generally, even though Mr. Burroughs was the head of Hasbro Entertainment, he spent little to no time in the company's venues. Mr. Burroughs had achieved his position based on his programming and business skills, not of his love of games and robots and pizza. Honestly, he thought most of what Fazbear Entertainment created was frivolous, even stupid, but he sought a position with the, pe the company right out of college because Fazbear Entertainment was a wildly um, successful corporation and he aspired to be the head of such an enterprise. He also had a knack for creating games, however much he didn't enjoy playing them. It was the challenge that he had, that he liked, sorry, uh, he supposed. Creating games and story-driven entertainment was like putting together a complex puzzle. Mr. Burroughs enjoyed mastering that kind of intricate thought. He planned since age five to be a multi-millionaire. He'd missed the mark by a couple of years, but he was where he wanted to be now. Uh, although he had a knack for business, he much preferred play to work. He applied himself not so he could m work more and more, but so he could afford his hobbies. Mr. Burroughs had expensive hobbies. Golf was the most affordable. Mr. Burroughs also loved yachts, scuba diving and collecting art. This was why Murray was starting to annoy him. Mr. Burroughs was missing out this weekend because he needed to see what was going on with the storyteller. According to the employees who monitored such things, many of the Pizza Plex shows were morphing in strange ways and several of the characters associated with various attractions like Monty's Gator Golf, Roxy Raceway, Fazza Blast and Bonnie Bowl were exhibiting unusual behaviours. It's not year one. Why is it not year one? I'm trying to work out why it's not year one. I, I mean, I agree with you. I definitely don't think this is early days of the Pizza Flex. I, it's, it's very kind of like mid, mid Pizza Flex era, I would say. Uh, or, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Glitch Trap is now here, so I, I would say Glitch Trap invaded quite early on, but not, not year one. I don't think. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I don't know. Something to think about. He figured he could get a sense of characters' antics if he visited Rockstar Road. Between shows, the main performers, Glamrock Freddy, Roxanne Wolf, Montgomery Gator, and Glamrock Chica, hung out in their green rooms. Bonnie is not there. Good thing to note. Good timeline placement again. He headed into the neon star-lined area, filled with gl uh, glass-fronted cases that featured a collection of props used by uh, both old and new animatronics. Mr. Burroughs strode toward Glamrock Freddy's green room. Green room was a misnomer for the red-walked area that was Glamrock Freddy's domain. Above the red walls, a giant bright blue neon star dominated the ceiling. There was nothing green about the room. <laughs> <laughs> The space was stuffed with various forms of Freddy's visage, uh, or visage, sorry. Uh, the bear's face was painted on the wall and displayed on posters, and the room held a large sculpture of Glamrock Freddy, as well as an oversized plush doll version of the character. And right now, the room also held Glamrock Freddy, but he wasn't at his best. Glamrock Freddy was a massive bear who sported a black blue bow tie and top hat encircled by a blue stripe. His body was painted bright orange and yellow with a turquoise lightning bolt on his chest and his broad shoulders were decorated with substantial red shoulder pads. He wore spiked bracelets and a red earring in his left ear. In other words, Glamrock Freddy was a badass. Glamrock Freddy was a badass, usually. Right now, however, Gl Freddy was acting more like a spoiled brat than a rock star. Mr. Burroughs' eyebrows arched as he watched Glamrock Freddy engage in a tugging match with a small pigtailed girl. The object being tugged was a furry plush version of the vintage Freddy Fazbear. That's mine! The little girl screeched as she determinedly grasped the bear's arm. Glamrock Freddy ignored her and continued to attempt to pull the bear from the little girl's clenched hand. Uh-oh, Mr. Burroughs thought. Before uh, Mr. Burroughs uh, took one step though, Freddy let go of the plush version of the predecessor. 
the sudden release of tension sent the girl reeling backward into her mother's embrace. The animatronics, although programmed to be entertaining and fun, were powerful machines. If they went off program, they could be dangerous. Glamrock Freddy turned his back on the girl and her mother, stomped to the far side of his green room, hunched his shoulders and started to cry. <laughs> wow! Wow! Look, oh, that's... I'm saving this gif as well, this is amazing. Getting some great gifs. Um, Mr. Burrows thinks the following. What in the name of all things Fazbear is going on here? <laughs> Something was rotten in the state of the pizza plex and Mr. Burrows was going to root it out and get rid of it. Turning on its heel, Mr. Burrows stalked out of Rockstar Row. Mr. Burrows, ploughing through the pizza plex's hoi polloi, was thinking about the next steps instead of focusing on what was going on. It wasn't a surprise, therefore, when he suddenly tripped over a toddler who had, un for unfathomable reasons, sat on the floor with a large orange crayon to draw a picture of one of the floor uh, tiles. Yeah. Uh, the view from the floor was an interesting one. Mr. Burroughs' eyes were mildly unfocused, and the sea of faces uh, against the rainbow-coloured backdrop of the storyteller's tree branches was bizarre, to say the least. Mr. Burroughs felt like he had fallen into a surreal painting. Seeking a focal point to get his bearings, he looked past the faces, up through the tree branches to the Pizzaplex atrium's glass roof, and that was when it hit him. He knew how Murray was getting into the storyteller tree. Mr. Burroughs had what he needed by the following Tuesday evening. Sebastian, the lead engineer of the Storyteller Tree Project, brought it to Mr. Burroughs at the end of the day. Sebastian had given him access to a control panel that Mr. Burroughs can mess around with and operate the tree. Okay. <clears throat> so apparently the tree is designed to block out all the oxygen in the tree when the hatch is closed because of the hardware in the Storyteller um, needs to be optimal positions. So... <laughs> Wait! Wait! Mr. Burroughs' plan is that when Murray sneaks in, he's going to close the hatch. I'm- I was about to say, um, there's definitely going to be a death in this story. Like, that's definitely how someone is going to die in this story. Murray is going to die by finding out the truth, or something like that, um, and then dying because of lack of oxygen in the tree. Something like that. But that's- that's his plan. Interesting! Oh, oh, Beef! Beef. Uh, CCTV, uh, CCTV cams were installed up on the platform so Mr. Burroughs could watch him go into the tree. He watched Murray go in and counted 60 seconds, and he pressed the button as he watched the hatch close. Mr. Burroughs uh, smirked. Mr. Burroughs was doing a uh, Fazbear Entertainment service. Murray had had what he was coming to him, and he was serving the consequences, Burroughs told himself. He believes he did the right thing, but something feels off. Keep in mind there's like 10, uh, 10 11 pages left. Firing Murray would cost Fazbear in millions. The salary in the buyout contract he was given was borderline scandalous. Perhaps this is another way of dealing with it. Wow, this guy is evil as hell. He's the head of Fazbear Entertainment. He is so evil. So fucked in the mind. <laughs> um, on Monday he went scuba diving, but he could not get the image of Murray trying to beat through the walls of the trunk out his head. He goes through days of board meetings and begins wondering why Murray hadn't tried to escape yet. Um, Oh, it takes a while for the oxygen to deplete. Um, there had been no signs of beating on the trunk the first few days of Edwin's confinement. Why wasn't Murray trying to escape? It was something Burroughs couldn't fathom or think of why um, he did this because he thought Edwin was causing the virus. Oh, now he's concerned because the glitches are spreading still after the time period of when he'd be dead. Oh, I see. During a board meeting, the tech suggests that they go inside the trunk and run diagnostics. Mr. Burroughs obviously was not going to let that happen. Uh, he doesn't want them to find out. He's now trying to convince himself Murray was sneaking out somehow still, and he had outsmarted them through a secret trapdoor. He wasn't going to deal with the conscience of his death or him not being responsible. He thought about consulting his engineers to look into the trunk, but no, that would expose what he had done. Mr. Burroughs had to look into it himself. This guy is silly. He decided he was going to do it during the busiest hour at the Pizzaplex. Perhaps the concourse would make his entrance hidden. Murray was such a pain in Burroughs' backside. The old man couldn't even die properly. He couldn't wait till he got his hands on Murray. He wanted to shake the teeth out of the man's skull. Um, it's during a concert at the Pizzaplex. He went to the tree. He expected to see Murray lunched over the keyboard, trying to rewrite the storyteller's programming. Instead, half buried under a mound of blank construction paper, Murray was sitting doubled over, a crayon clutched in his hand. He was unquestionably deceased. His eyes open and cloudy. He appeared to have died in the middle of a drawing 
yet another odd stick figure. He had written I'm sorry on one of the notes. His left hand lay above the words, palm open up as if asking for forgiveness. Mr Burrows stumbled, every nerve ending in his body told him to run out of the tree. Mr Burrows suddenly felt like he was standing in the midst of a contagion. Uh, he's trying to use the palm scanner to get out, but it's not working, <gasps> despite it being engineered to work on his palm. Now he's banging on the door and screaming, trying to get out and see if anyone would hear him. Hey security, I'm in here, get him out, or get me out, he bellowed over and over. He gasped for air. Mr Burrow's gaze landed on the cables that extended from the storyteller. Of course, if he disconnected the connection between the storyteller and the pizzaplex, the attraction was a malfunction. Someone would come to help, right? Mr. Burroughs dove toward the cables that extended from the storyteller, grabbing them both, ha grabbing them with both hands. He yanked away the cables from the storyteller's platform. This has given me, um, what's that story called? Um, Fine Player Two vibes. It's given me Fine Player Two vibes, where uh, the, the person is left to die, uh, and then the other person comes back and finds out that they died, and then dies themselves in the same way. All kind of friendly face as well. Uh, that happens. They both died to a truck. <laughs> um, they came free easily uh, but when they did the storyteller its white metal tiger head lit up into a night sky it did not go dark stop it turn off he's yelling at the tiger head Mr Burroughs growled in frustration he began plummeting the storyteller stop running he yelled once again he's punching it his knuckles began to bleed as he pounded the tiger's snout with his fists it's not working the tiger's still working idiot he staggered to his feet Mr. Burroughs then lunged, um, lunged toward the control panel. He entered his password. Password failed. Wow. I'm just going to hide this up to this little page and then I have to BRB. Burroughs fell to his knees. He howled. He couldn't shut down the storyteller. He then starts banging on the door more as he loses consciousness, screaming, and all he can hear on the other side is the sound of children's laughter. Outside the tree trunk, the trunk's swollen belly-like appearance made the little kids giggle, and it made the older kids want to know what was inside. Kids of all ages circumnavigated the tree, chasing one another until they dropped. Wow. I just got the shivers. That's amazing. You know that, why, why that's amazing? Because they introduced very early, like, oh, what's in the tree? What, who is the storyteller? What's in the tree? And by the end of the story, there's stuff going on in the tree People don't realise. I mean, no one else is in the room where it happened. Um, you know? Like, nobody else is in the tree. Everyone's wondering what's in the tree. But there's actually something going on in the tree. I love that. This is a brilliant story. This... It's, it's one of the top stories for me. I really like the characters. Uh, I really like... Um, the the reveals i guess not really reveals but like this is how glitchtrap got into the systems this is pretty big stuff i really like this i really like this um i forgot to mention when rushing edwin's drawings also had strange symbols that mr burrows could not understand what they mean oh interesting wow <laughs> what what Reddit, Discord, in the... All that money will go to shit since use. Wait, really? That's cool. Okay, use use Reddit, Discord on Fortnite. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bobby Dot's conclusion is going to be... Or Bobby Dot's conclusion is going to be finished on the 10th of February. So expect another video in exactly a week um, for the Bobby Dot's conclusion reaction. Um, guys, thank you so much for watching. Seriously, thank you. Uh, make sure you subscribe as well. Uh, let me know what you think of this story in the comments. I really, really enjoyed it. So thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next time. Goodbye.